Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Well, it's not Sabbath here yet, but I hope you all have a blessed Sabbath. We're going to continue uh, with A.T. Jones, looking at his uh, appeal for evangelical Christianity and um, the things that we can learn about it or learn from it. And we know, again, I'm just reviewing. Basically, we're, we're finishing off this series of the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. Uh, by looking at Wagner and Jones and what happened to them when their relationship with the church changed. With Wagner, it was really a rejection of truth. With Jones, not so much. He still remains a solid Seventh-day Adventist, but he has uh, the church has a problem with him, and so we're reading about how they treated him. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and the blessings that we can have in fellowship with you and with one another. We need your presence in our lives, Lord. We know sometimes this world can be discouraging, and that our, our view of what's happening around us can drag us down. We know that there are things that we hope for that do not happen and things that come unexpectedly upon us uh, to try us and to test us and to develop in us a Christ-like character. So we ask, Lord, that we can learn to depend upon you and that in the crisis that exists within this movement, within the world, that uh, we can be faithful. We know that character is not developed in a crisis, but it's, or it's not uh, developed, but it's revealed. We know that these small crises are are not going to be as difficult as what's coming, but they do help prepare us. So they're really not a crisis in that sense. But um, anyway, Lord, we thank you again for this time, and we pray that we can understand this topic clearly and apply it to our lives correctly. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. More good evening again. and. Uh, we were finishing off, we, we read this uh, last paragraph, but I'm going to start with the paragraph we read from A.T. Jones, an appeal for evangelical Christianity. He says, therefore, disagreement with church leaders to dissent from religious authorities, even to occupy an attitude of an antagonism to them is never in itself any evidence of error or fault. No man, no association or combination of men ever had any authority because of any official position or place in the Church of Christ, or in any church professing to be the Church of Christ. And when any man or set of men ever does have it in any church, it is because that church is of men only and not of Christ. The princes of the Gentiles, the heathen, exercise dominion over them, and their great ones exercise authority, authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Among Christians... It is not so, and whenever it is so in any church, in just so far that is a heathen church, for it is only among the Gentiles that such things are done and allowed to be done. And he's going to read from Desire of Ages. Now, the idea here that, that Joneses presents, we have to agree with. That is, any authority cannot come from men. And we, we see that there is a parallel in this movement with what has happened with Jones. That is, he recognizes something that we should be able to recognize that has happened in the church. And most of us can recognize it in the church. Uh, but we often don't recognize it when it's in our midst, especially if we're the ones who are exercising the authority, or if the authority that's being exercised is in agreement with our personal feelings or beliefs or preferences. And some people, of course, submit to authority because it's easy to do. They want to have some authority that is in some way in line with their basic uh, personal predilections. But um, often they're not really even uh, submissive to that authority in all ways. They, they like to appear submissive if there is some personal advantage. And so a lot of politics happens in the area of authority, 
So politicking can happen in the people who are in authority, but also to the people who are under that authority. That is, they'll take positions and have attitudes because there is a party spirit going on. And we know this movement was infected with the party spirit. We saw it, Heidi and I, back in 2018 when we were there. And that party spirit also had another type of party spirit as well. That is, there's the fun stuff. Um, a lot of the young people were interested in having fun and didn't like us boomers, you know, taking away their fun. So Parminder and Tess were able to appeal to their to their natures. And that's why many of the young people uh, went with Parminder because they were having fun. So there's two different types of party spirits. But, you know, we're talking mostly about the party spirit where people take sides. And um, the only side that we are to be on is God's side. And we are to bring others to God and allow people to make decisions for themselves so that they can be solid Christians. It doesn't help if we manipulate people in some way to take a stance, either by social pressure or, or threat or um, any other kind of manipulation. It doesn't advantage them that they happen to be orthodox in our mind, in their thinking, if they don't really understand it. So now, of course, Jones isn't just dealing with uh, theology here. He's dealing with the role and function of the church itself. And that is the role and the function of the church is to be a cooperative adventure, right? It It's a volunteer organization. I, I pointed this out to a couple of pastors. And I said, you know, you can't just bully your way to get what you want because people aren't going to do it. You, you have to be able to allow people to be a part of the decision making process. And he just says, well, it takes too much energy. The one pastor, it takes too much energy, too much time. Well, it's just the reality. God has to do with that with us. You, you really don't get anything accomplished by exercising authority. It always backfires. It might in the short term get you some results, but in the long term, it's antithetical to um, the gospel and to the development of the church. So anyway, Jones is going to uh, quote here. In the kingdom of the world, position meant self-aggrandizement. The people were supposed to exist for the benefit of the ruling classes, influence, wealth, education, were so many means of gaining control of the masses for the use of the leaders. The higher classes were to think, decide, enjoy, and rule. The lower were to obey and serve. Religion, like all things else, uh, was a matter of authority. The people were expected to believe and practice as their superiors dictated. The right of man, as man, to think and act for himself was wholly unrecognized. Christ was establishing a kingdom on a different principles, on different principles. He called men not to authority, but to service, the strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education, place their possessor under greater obligation to serve his fellows. To even the lowliest of Christ's disciples, it is said, all things are for your sakes. <clears throat> In matters of conscience, the soul must be left untrammeled. No one is to control another's mind, to judge for another, or to prescribe his duty. God gives to every soul freedom to think and to follow his own convictions. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. No one has a right to merge his own individuality in that of another. In all matters where principle is involved, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In Christ's kingdom, there is no lordly oppression, no compulsion of manner. The angels of heaven do not come to the earth to rule and to exact homage, but as messengers of mercy to cooperate with men in uplifting humanity. Now, so this, these are very strong statements, and we're going to see Jones is going to basically say the same thing. Now, we have within the church. So let's deal with the church first. You know, Seventh-day Adventist church is not to have a creed. We have a statement of beliefs that are not to be used as as a creed. Now, 
My understanding is that there's a difference as far as an organization is concerned with the role of a minister rather than a church member. And, you know, we could have discussion about this maybe a bit too, but obviously as an employer, there are things that are required of the employee that 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 employee is in a sense giving over to to the institution. But it needs to be done willingly. A person shouldn't be bullied into submission. But anytime we work with others, there always has to be compromises. That is, there has to be things that we do that wouldn't be what we would do if we were just on our own, right? Think of a marriage relationship. I mean, if you're on your own, you can do what you want. But if you're married, you now have to negotiate some of those decisions. Now, if you have a marriage where just uh, one of the, the spouses rules and makes all of the decisions, it's definitely not not good. Even if it's the man, if he just makes decisions and never takes into account uh, his wife, he might not be very married very long. Now, if he's a good man, he will include his wife in decisions. And if she's a good wife, she will acquiesce when there is mild disagreement, right? So she may not be what she would do, but, you know, she's been consulted. They decide together and somebody has to make the ultimate decision. And it's best if it's the man, because men are going to be less emotional generally than women in making decisions. And, and some people don't like that. They think, you know, that, you know, that's some kind of abuse if a man makes a decision. But, uh, you know, the reality is you have two people. They have to come to some kind of agreement on how decisions are made. Now, if you're working with other people in an organization you're, or you're organized in some way, there's going to be things that you're going to do, tasks that you might be given that aren't really tasks that you would like to do, but somebody has to do it. And, you know, there are some people who, who won't do anything that anybody asks them to do. Now, we talked a bit about this before. Kelly knows me from my teenage years, and I was not a person who liked to be told what to do. So I, I was a little bit of a rebel to authority, but it depends on how that authority was given. I definitely didn't like arbitrary authority. I didn't like to be told to do things without negotiation because I don't mind doing things. But if I'm just told I have to do something, it's the law is laid down, I'm going to resist a little bit naturally. Um, that would be my nature doing that. But I learned as a Christian that I needed to cooperate with others. It wasn't something I liked. I had to, it became a part of the church. And, and that meant that I had to, there was this body of Christ. There was people who were different. They thought different. And I found that there was a great blessing in submitting to proper authority. Obviously, I didn't do anything against my conscience or my beliefs, but I would still sometimes do things that I didn't think were the best way to do them. And that's always tough for me. I like to do things the best way. And so other people's ways of doing things, I would still wholeheartedly support them in doing it, even if I didn't think it was the best way. If I couldn't persuade them to do it my way, I did it their way. And usually the result was that it didn't turn out uh, the way they expected because there's things that they didn't have in their experience or understand that I had. And sometimes there's things that I did on my own or if I was the decision was mine um, that didn't work out as well because maybe somebody else had a better perspective. And so, so I learned that cooperating with others is extremely important but difficult. It's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, we obviously know in matters of conscience, the soul must be left untrammeled. And, and this is one of the issues that I find within the Adventist church that uh, I thought was easy to solve if people just use some reason. And one was the issue of music. People wanted, you know, I don't know if you remember the celebration movement, but people wanted to have more lively music or more contemporary music in, in churches. I'm not sure why. Was the music was a pretty low quality that a lot of people wanted to introduce into the church. Uh, pretty, pretty bad music as far as I was concerned from a musician's point of view. Not well written songs, a lot of these sort of cheap courses and, and so forth. And then of course they wanted to liven it up with some, 
some kind of percussion or a band or something like that. And it's pretty simple. If, if somebody in your congregation is uncomfortable with it, you don't do it. And it doesn't matter if you think, well, there's nothing wrong with it. The point, the point is you don't do it because somebody's uncomfortable with it. It doesn't matter what you can say. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. That could be true. Maybe there isn't, but you don't do it because you're not considering the needs of the other person. And nobody needs to have any kind of lively music or, or anything. It's not a need. It's just a want. So I never understood the problem, why that was ever a problem, just to say, well, no, you just don't get the music you would like. It's pretty simple. Um, that's not why you go to church. You don't go there for entertainment. If you want to listen to music on your own at home, go ahead. Nobody's going to stop you. But when it's in a church... You have to go to the highest standard, right? And and you can't do something that's going to make anybody uncomfortable. Just the vote of one is enough, as far as I'm concerned, because it's just it's just not an important issue. But anyway, it requires working with others, listening to others, gaining consensus, and it's it's hard. It's hard to work with others. It's way easier to work on your own. But um, that's what we have to do, we have to work with others. And in that is a development of character. So Jones is going to say, um, comment on these statements. He says, that is precisely where I stand. And that is only what I preach from the Bible. The kingdom, kingdom of God, as it is in itself, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, as Christ brought it to, to the world. The kingdom of God, as it is in the individual soul. The kingdom of God as it is in the church of God, the kingdom of God as it is presently to be covering the earth as the waters cover the sea, the kingdom of God in which on the part of the governor, the only principle is government with the consent of the governed, and in which and on the part of the governed, the only principle is self-government in God and with God according to the will of God. That kingdom in which according there be no place for anyone to rule another. The only field of activity is loving service to one another, right? So when people are seeking their own, they're seeking power, they're seeking position or control, even in little minor minor matters, that's not Christ-like. It's not part of God's kingdom. That kingdom in which the soul is left untraveled, that kingdom in which no one seeks to control another's mind, to judge for another, or to prescribe his duty, that kingdom in which every soul enjoys his God-given freedom to think and to follow his own convictions, that kingdom in which everyone gives account of himself only to God, that kingdom where there is no lordly oppression nor any compulsion even of manner, that is what I preach. Just that is what I have been preaching, and that is what I shall continue to preach. For it is the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom which is to be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. The next passage is on page 826. In the commission of his disciples, Christ not only outlined their work, but gave them the message. Teach the people, he said, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The disciples were to teach what Christ had taught that which he had spoken, not only in person, but through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament, is here included. Human teaching is shut out. There's no place for tradition, for men's theories and conclusions, or for church legislation. No laws ordained by ecclesiastical authority are included in the commission. None of these are Christ's servants to teach. The law and the prophets, with the record of his own words and deeds, are the treasure committed to the disciples to be given to the world. Christ's name is their watchword, their badge of distinction, their bond of union, the authority for their course of action, and the source of their success. Nothing that does not bear his superscription is to be recognized in his kingdom. So again, a very clear statement from the spirit of prophecy. So Jones goes on, in, in the teaching that Christ has commissioned me to teach, there's no place for tradition, 
There's no place for men's theories and conclusions. No place for any church legislation. No place for any laws ordained by ecclesiastical authority. None of these are Christ's servants to teach. Then what is the good and what is the use of your church legislation, of constitutions, laws, resolutions, any or all of your laws ordained by ecclesiastical authority? None of these are Christ's servants to teach. Then by what right do you require that I shall teach such things? Now, all of this is the desired ages without any explanation or qualification is precisely my attitude in all of my publications and published statements and in all my preaching. Is that antagonistic to the organized work? If so, why? And even if it is, how can I help that? It is the truth, as the truth is in the Bible and in Jesus. Yet even that is not all. From your own standard publications, here is a special testimony, Series B, number 10, Jehovah is our King. I've told the president of your general conference and others, and now I tell you, tell to you that I stand in full agreement with this in just what it says. And if you will stand there, then there cannot possibly be any difference, much less antagonism, between us as to the organization. This message says these words. God declares, I will be glorified in my people, but the self-confident management of men has resulted in putting God aside and accepting the devisings of men. I never said anything as strong as that. I, I never said anything more antagonistic to the organized work than that. Is that testimony antagonistic to the organized work? Or is it antagonistic to the organized work to teach the Bible that which will effectually prevent that which this testimony says has resulted. That is, putting God aside and accepting the devisings of men. When God has been put aside by men in the church and the devisings of men are accepted instead, then I know what that means, don't you? And I do not want it. Do you? The kingship of Jehovah and that each one shall find God to be his king in the kingdom of God instead of any kingdom of men in the place of God. This is only what I am preaching everywhere and what I shall continue to preach. This testimony says in so many words, this message is spoken to our churches in every place. And that these words are needed in every place where a church is established. And yet it is the plain truth that hardly any churches in any place have ever had a chance to know that it is in existence. Why? And though it has been put in, been in print a year and a half, the tract societies haven't it and never had it for supply. And the only way to get it was to send directly to the Pacific Press for it at five cents a copy. Why? Is it because that this testimony too is held by these same ones to be antagonistic to the organized work? Further, this says, for years there's been a growing tendency for men placed in positions of responsibility to lord it over God's heritage, thus removing from church members their keen sense of the need of divine instruction and an appreciation of the privilege of counsel with God regarding this duty. This order of things must be changed. There must be a reform. That this order of things shall be changed and there be reform is all that I have ever asked for. And why is that antagonistic to the organized work? Further, I read, from Desire of Ages, or from this special testimony, pardon me. In my earlier experiences in the message, I was called to meet this evil during my labors in Europe and Australia, and more recently, at the San Jose camp meeting in 1905, I had to bear my testimony of warning against it because souls were being led to look to man for wisdom instead of looking to God, who is our wisdom, our sanctification, and our righteousness. And now, so it's 1907, the same message has again been given me, more definite and decisive, because there has been a deeper offense to the spirit of God. Again, I read, 
I write thus fully because I have been shown that ministers and teachers are tempted more and more to trust in finite man for wisdom and to make flesh their arm. To conference presidents and men in responsible places, I bear this message. Break the bands and fetters that have been placed upon God's people. To you, the word is spoken. Break every yoke. Unless you cease the working of making men amendable to men, unless you become humble in heart, and yourselves learn the way of the Lord as little children, the Lord will divorce you from his work. Is it true that bands and fetters have been placed upon God's people? I didn't say that there had, but this testimony says that there has, and that as late as October of 1907, and you profess to believe that this is instruction from God, is that antagonistic to the organized work? Without telling the people that bands and fetters have been placed upon them, I've been and shall continue to be teaching the people how to free from all such things as bands and fetters and yokes. Is that antagonistic? to the organized work? If so, how can I help it? After thus telling the conference presidents and men in responsible positions what they shall do, after telling to all the churches that the self-confident management of men has resulted in putting God aside and accepting the devisings of men, after telling to all that Christ wants no power set over them that will restrict their freedom in his service, that he has never placed man as a ruler over his heritage, and that true Bible religion will lead to self-control, not to the control of one another. But then it turns and tells to the individual what he shall do. Here is only one of these. Every church member should understand that God is the one to whom to look for an understanding of individual duty. It is right that brethren should counsel together. But when men arrange just what their brethren shall do, let them answer, that they have chosen the Lord as their counselor. Those who will humbly seek him will find his grace sufficient. But when one man allows another to step in between him and the duty that God has pointed out to him, giving to man his confidence and accepting him as guide, then he steps from the true platform to a false and dangerous one. Such a man, instead of growing and developing, will lose his spirituality. There is no power in any man to remedy the defective character. Individually, our hope and trust must be in one who is more than human. Now, this brings up a really important point that that often is overlooked in this discussion. Why is it, according to the spirit of prophecy, why is it that we are not to control another man? What is she saying? Why does this Why is it that we are not to do that? What will result if we try to control people, telling them what to do, coming in between them and God? Place God in in their in their minds and in their lives. We're not called to do that. Everyone is to look to God for authority. Okay, but what 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 is the result? Because we often reason that we want to control things that the church wants to, or this movement is. We're trying to protect people from error, right? That's that's always the profession. You know, we don't want people teaching error. And so we're not going to listen to this error. We have decided, somebody's decided, that what somebody's saying is error. And we're going to make sure that that person never gets a voice. But why is that dangerous, according to the spirit of prophecy? What will it, what will it accomplish when we control others or try to control others? It helps them from growing spiritually. Okay, right? So if you make decisions for others, they are never going to grow, right? Like, I mean, it's true. When my kids were little, there's lots of decisions I made for them. But as they were able, I allowed them to make decisions for themselves in certain areas of their lives so that they could become independent of me. I didn't want my children to be forever dependent upon me to tell them what to do. I wanted them to become independent, to make their own decisions and their own choices, even in the area of spirituality. Because I knew if I was to control their spirituality, that they would never grow spiritually. 
And even though it's painful at times seeing them make mistakes in their spiritual life, the reality is that they would not be served if I had made those decisions for them. I gave them an example. And in the end, you pray that they will make the right decision. Now, lots of things happen in life, right? Relationships break down. Um, people go their own way. And um, you hope that you have an influence over that person long term. But the worst thing would be, you know, to control that individual. You might be able to keep them in the church, uh, but it, but they're not going to be spiritually strong. And so you have to you have to trust that God can work with that individual. And and in leadership within a church, what you what you are to do is not control other people but to be an example in service, in love, in you know, humility, all those different characteristics of Christ, of patience, of kindness, and have an influence. And even though things may not go the way that you expect, they're going to go much better in the long term if you follow Christ's example. So the idea of controlling others, to controlling the work to get things accomplished, it might seem good to human judgment, but in the end, it's going to make weak workers. Now, one of the things about Adventism that I like, um, and why I became an Adventist, is that I found that most Adventists, at least when I became an Adventist, were very independent minded. That is, we could have a discussion in Sabbath school that could be called heated, and that was acceptable. People didn't have to toe the party line. People could express differences of opinion. Um, and that to me was just an amazing thing. I'd never seen it in any other church. And I'd been to lots of churches. People just basically give pat answers in like Sunday school. And people could even contradict each other and not know it in their comments because nobody's really thinking. They're just saying things that sound nice. But Adventists seem to be much more interested in getting to the truth of something. And, and so Adventists also are, are the most represented Christian denomination on the internet. And one of the reasons is Adventists have ministries. Now, I don't know if it's true today, but, but it was, you know, initially uh, Adventists. And, and you find this too, if you do searches, you're going to run into lots of Adventist material, but churches where they depend upon, where the members depend upon the church to have the websites. Obviously there's going to be a lot less websites if just the church has the website. But, you know, lots of Adventists have their ministries. Now, they're not always teaching the same things. There's lots of contradiction. The church doesn't like that. The people who profess to be Adventists might have different opinions. But it's actually quite healthy. So, and especially as, as an individual. Obviously, working together with the church, you, you have to set aside some types of individuality, some, some of your own wishes and desires, but nothing that's going to go against your conscience or personal belief. And if you did have beliefs that were different than the church, then you, you probably wouldn't want to be a part of that church, right? Why would you be a part of a church where you don't believe like they believe? And obviously you can't demand that the church believes like you. So everybody has to make their choice. Anyway, uh, Jones goes on. He says, now, please bear in mind that I have not read this matter from Desire of Ages and Jehovah is our King as proof of evidence that what I hold and teach is the truth. I know that from the Bible, and I teach it from the Bible. What I have read um, these passages for from these two authoritative publications of the denomination is solely to show that by your own authoritative publications, there's ground for serious question as to whether my attitude is antagonistic to the organized work in any other way than that in which the attitude of Jesus was antagonistic to the religious authorities and the leaders of Jerusalem the organized work of his day. So then, moral character is not the standard of good standing here. It is something else. Doctrinal integrity is not the standard of good standing. It is something else. Harmony with the standard and authoritative publications of the denomination is not the standard of good standing. It is still something else. But when you are carried beyond all these, still to something else as the standard, and that something else cannot be anything else than the arbitrary will 
and authority of men passing themselves off as the church. And one of the very first of Protestant churches is op is opposition to the arbitrary authority of the church. Not that many Protestant churches practice that. But anyway, but now and in view of the situation, I am disposed to waive all demurrer and to answer on the merits the charge that I am antagonistic to the organized work. What is the organized work? What is the organized work of the denomination in just what is claimed for it and just what it is officially stated to be? In plain fact, it is not only confessed, but it is officially written and officially published that the professed organization of Seventh-day Adventists is that of the Mosaic Order. In the official statement and publication of this fact, the Mosaic Order is fully outlined as such in eight numbered points. Then upon the outline of the exclusively Mosaic Order, that official statement says, the general plan of the organization adopted by Seventh-day Adventists is very similar to that outlined above. And then to show this very similar character, there's drawn and set down in six numbered points, a parallel with the outline of the Mosaic Order. And then this official statement says, this comparison might be carried further, but what has been pointed out will prove sufficient to make it plain that there is a very close resemblance between that simple, complete, and efficient system of organization provide, provided for the church established by Moses and the organized work organization worked out for the remnant church called out by the threefold message of Revelation 14, verse 6 to 14. The president of the General Conference in Review and Herald, May 16, 1907, pages 4 to 5. Okay. There is then no possible room for question that the form of organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church denomination is professedly that of the Mosaic order, and this to the exclusion of the Christian order. For in the whole statement, Christ is neither mentioned nor referred to, nor is there any reference at all to any New Testament scripture, except only the single one of Revelation 14. The New Testament itself is not even mentioned except in the insinuation of the false suggestion that the Mosaic order was for the direction and government of the church in both the Old and New Testament times. The truth is that the Mosaic order of organization was no more for the direction and government of the church in New Testament times than that Moses himself is the direction and government of the church in New Testament times. Moses himself was for the Mosaic or Old Testament times, and Christ himself is the Christian or New Testament times. The Mosaic order was for the direction and government of the church in the Mosaic or Old Testament times only and not and cannot possibly have any place in the church of the Christian or New Testament times. The Christian order and the Christian order alone is for the direction and government of the church in the Christian or New Testament times. Now, this might seem a little bit odd to us. I mean, have we ever heard that the church is organized after the Mosaic order? As Seventh Day Adventists, have we ever heard that? This is the first time for me. Yeah. So obviously, it was was the case back in 1907. You know, they, they've obviously changed how they have described the organization of the church. I would think that they would look at it under the gospel order. As that's what I've heard. So this is kind of odd, but this is what Jones is dealing with at this time. So. You know, to go back to Moses in the Mosaic order for any such purpose as that, which is set forth in the official statement as to the organization of the Seventh day Adventists, is nothing else than to abandon Christ in the Christian order wholly. So the church may have changed that. Maybe it has something to do with A.T. Jones and what happened in that history or some other history. I don't know. I don't know the history of that. So the Mosaic order of the second century, which is his title here, I will, I will never agree to it. I know what it means, for it was tried once, and I know what it meant then, and that is exactly the course that was taken in the second and third centuries after Christ in the first steps of the papacy. This can be verified by anyone who will only look through the pages of the church history of that time, but I may not be counted too personal and pointed in this. I will say here what I have written in another place of that first attempt in adopting the Mosaic order of Christian times. Here's what I said of that attempt. But again, there came a falling away. Again, God is, as king was abandoned, Christ as leader and commander to the people. 
and as only entitled to preeminence, preeminence was set aside. Man, loving to have the preeminence, assumed his place. The Holy Spirit, as sovereign and guide in and of the church, was supplanted with the devisings and machinery of men, again, like all the nations. Yet this was not done in open and confessed disregard of God. It was all done under cover of the scripture and as the manifestation of the divine order itself. This deception was accomplished through the pretense of adopting the Mosaic order of organization. But to go back to the Mosaic order was in itself, and at one plunge, the total abandonment of the Christian order. This would have been true even if the Mosaic order had been truly and completely adopted. But the true adoption of the Mosaic order was simply impossible. Under the Mosaic order, the people were a compact mass, separate from all other people and dwelling by tribes compacted compactly within specific and narrow limitations. And the area of the whole nation being one sixth less and the people being four or six or even eight times more than that of Connecticut. To think then of applying that order in the case of people who were scattered all over the known world, dwelling promiscuously among all the people of the world, one here, another yonder, two or three here and four or five there, a small company in one city and no other within many miles. To think of applying in truth the Mosaic order and an organization in such a situation as that could not possibly be anything else than sheer wild uh, human, human, humanitist, I can't say that word, humanisticalicious. No. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, human nonsense, how's that? And in fact, it never was either adopted or applied in truth. Uh, the scheme was never anything but a pretense, a contrivance to save appearances. But it served the ambitious clerics as a means of hoodwinking the people and giving to themselves a show of divine sanction for their own assumed authority to reign against Christ and in the place of God. For how easy and natural it was under that Mosaic order to hold before the people the presumption and faith. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and others, as the divine and awful warning to all men who should dare anything against the bishop, for we must look upon the bishop as upon the Lord himself. And this humanisticalish, humanisticalish, I don't know what that word is, thing, which from the beginning was only a wicked invention of perverse-minded men, this thing that was wholly the fruit of apostasy, this thing that sprang only from the abandonment of the Christian order and the adoption of a fraud on the Mosaic order, this thing that was only the fruit of the rejection of Christ for Moses and thus the substitution of themselves for Christ, this utterly anti-Christian thing, they who made it called the kingdom of God, made it uh, called the kingdom of God, the only one and only true church. But it was never anything else than only the kingdom of man in the place of God. It is therefore plain, is therefore plain truth that in this openly professed adoption of the Mosaic and Old Testament order of organization, there has never been taken by the Seventh-day Adventist denomination the same open and definite step in the very course of the papacy. This simply cannot be denied. The parallel is perfect. In the review and herald on this subject by general conference officials, there has been set down in substance and almost in very words the arguments of Ignatius and Cyprian, and even of the full-fledged papacy, even such a statement as that in Peter, as in leading brethren now whom God is using, these companies of believers are united in the Holy Ghost. That's from the Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1907. In Peter, in Peter, believers were united in the Holy Ghost? Think of that. That is precisely in very thought the claim of the papacy on behalf of Peter, and on behalf of the Bishop of Rome as the successor of blessed Peter. And lo, just as in Peter, so in leading brethren now, believers are united in the Holy Ghost. It is not true. In Christ, the crucified one, in Christ, in Christ alone, are believers ever united in the Holy Ghost. But I have not time to follow that utterly false lead. Do you hold that? Do you endorse that position? So, you know, we're reading this. And of course, I think all of us are thinking about different situations and even what exists in the movement today. So I believe, like Jones, 
that individuals need to know the truth for themselves, that no man can set himself up as an authority, as a gate treat, a, a gatekeeper um, to control or tell people what they should do, that it's going to make weak Christians if people are just going to follow man. It doesn't mean that you don't make biblical arguments and discuss and study and try to understand things, but nobody can use authority and say, I have the authority to tell you as a prophet or as the leader of a movement or anything, what you must think about anything. I can tell you what the Bible says. That person can tell you what the Bible says. And you can study it for yourself and decide whether what that the Bible says that or not. But if they are going to use their position or their power or their authority to shut out people and to not have discussions or studies because people are teaching error, uh, they're not doing a benefit to the, to the movement. The movement is not going to develop. The, the members are not going to develop a Christ-like character because Christ-like character requires patience and love and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness. It requires obedience to God. It, it, it requires trusting that God can take care of individuals, even individuals that we think are struggling. And if they are struggling, our responsibility is to go to them individually and minister to them and talk to them and share with them and sometimes plead with them to see something a certain way. But if we just shut them out, we never, they never get a chance to be heard and we misrepresent their views. The, the movement is weaker for it in the long run. And that person may be lost because of our inability to, to actually uh, act as Christ in sharing the truth. So we are not to shut out people. We're not going to anathemize people because they don't believe exactly the same way that we do. If somebody's teaching error, you can show where it's error. You don't have to attack the person. You don't have to attack their character. You don't have to misrep what, re misrepresent what they're saying because if they're teaching error, you can easily show that it's error. But often, we can't show that it's error because it isn't error. And so we have to misrepresent the person and, um, and what they're teaching so that we can make a case that the person is, is teaching error. And the people who just accept that without looking at it themselves are going to be worse off than if we allow them to study with that person and look at things for themselves. So, um, the Seventh-day Adventist professed organization is is not that of the Mosaic order in truth. It is only, as that before, a fallacious pretense of it. And this is demonstrated in the fact that in this present case, this professedly organized work after the Mosaic order absolutely disregarded the plain words of the very first principle of justice as in the Mosaic order. And whoever heard of the captains and elders of Israel making a constitution and bylaws for themselves? Instead of this, Seventh-day Adventist organized work being truly after the Mosaic order is exactly the repetition of that system of professed organization that resulted from abandoning the New Testament order in the second and third centuries. And that was the first stage toward the fully developed and reigning popedom. But you may have better words than mine upon this. I present the following from Diabagne, who makes the matter so plain that none can fail to see it. Three great systems. Three great systems, in point of fact, held sway in the church previously to the epoch of the Reformation. First, the evangelical, which is the primitive system, but which extends only to the commencement of the second century. Then the word of God reigns supreme, and a living faith in the grace which that word proclaims was regarded as entirely sufficient for saving the sinner. But at the commencement of the second century, the void left in the church by the death of the apostles and the invasion of the house of God by the human element brought about a general alteration in the spirit and organization of the church. And the great crisis ensued. Then began the Catholic or Episcopal system. It was not until later, no doubt, that the Episcopal, Episcopal 
came to be considered as the necessary necessary divinely instituted form of Christian society. It was not until later that communion with an episcopate connected with the apostles by an unbroken succession was required as a condition of salvation. But dating from the second century, these ideas began to take shape and the congregational episcopate of Ignatius prepared the way for the hierarchical episcopate of Cyprian. That system, with some shades of difference, prevailed in the church down to about the 8th century. And third, it was about this epoch that the third system, that of popedom, began. It had long been in progress, and the pride of the popes fondly dreamed of sovereignty. And then it was that the Church of the West, feeling the need of a chief to govern it, that immense hierarchy, at once secular and religious, which had been founded in the course of the preceding period, admitted the pretensions of Rome, Catholicism passed into Romanism, and the monarchical regime took the place of the arist aristocratical that had preceded it. These three systems, which followed one on another before the, great Ref before the Reformation, have divided Christendom ever since the great revolution of the 16th century, and all who bear the name of, Christ, of Christians are now grouped under one or other of these forms. To leave the third of these systems for the second amounts to most to a half reformation at most to a half reformation. And it need not say that the first of the three has all my sympathies. The internal and spiritual unity of the invisible church consisting in faith and love was at an early date confounded with the external unity of the visible church, which manifests itself in certain forms. This is what was done particularly by Cyprian in what he wrote on the unity of the church. An external representation of that unity was ever felt to be wanted, and it was sought for a certain primacy over the other apostles, which was claimed on behalf of St. Peter, primacy altogether opposed to the word of God and to the essence of the Christian economy expressed in these words, all ye are brethren. The same distance that separates popedom from Episcopal Catholicism separates also Episcopal Catholicism itself from Evangelical Christianity. I do not mean to say by this that there cannot be in the last system ministers called bishops and exercising certain special functions. What I reject is dogmatical Episcopacy, Episcopacy, yeah, Episcopacy, that's the right word, not constitutional Episcopacy. Episcopacy, yeah, okay. What I combat is the idea that in order to a man's being a member of Christ's body, it is not enough for him to be united to the Savior. Is it? It, it is. Okay. What I combat is the idea that in order to a man's being a member of Christ's body, it is not enough for him to be united to the Savior by a real living faith. Right? So it's kind of an awkward sentence, but you get the point. What I point to as a heresy is the strange opinion that in order to belong to Christ, one must be connected with an external organization which goes back or rather pretends to go back to the apostles. The evangelical system is the preeminence of the spirit above form. The Catholic system is the preeminence of form above spirit. According to the former, it is in the connection of the soul with Christ that that soul's connection with the church is involved. According to the latter, it is in the connection of the soul with the church that there is involved that which it bears with Jesus Christ. The same difference presents itself when we have, when we have to do with God's ministers. According to the evangelical system in its grace, spiritual capacity the legit, that legitimizes the charge of the ministry and that procures it, whereas according to the Catholic system, it is, on the contrary, the charge, the ordination of the holy ministry that communicates grace, spiritual capacity. Further, it is the same as if we have to do with the commencement of the church. According either to the popedom or Catholicism of the external church comes first, Christ, first of all, found a certain ecclesiastical organism which ought then, in virtue of certain privileges, to act upon the internal or spiritual. According to the evangelical Christianity, on the contrary, the internal church 
comes first. Christ, by his spirit, first of all saves, converts souls. These converted souls unite themselves into a community forming the external visible church. Spiritual life is the real tie to the members of the Christian community, according to the evangelical system. Adhesion to the hierarchical unity represented by the episcopacy forms this tie, according to the popish and Catholic doctors. Religious equality subsists in the evangelical system, notwithstanding the aristocracy of its office bearers, for the charges with which they are invested are less a dignity than a service, and their authority pro proceeds not from their persons, but from the word of God and the action of the spirit. But in the Catholic, as well as in the papal system, religious equality disappears. The authority of the office takes the place of the authority of the word. The bishop becomes the exclusive channel of the divine favors and thus stands as mediator between God and the Christian people. To say the truth, Catholicism is in its principles further removed from evangelical Christianity, Christianity than it is from the papal system itself. Um, so that's... Um, Introductory essay to Rank's History of the Popes. You know, just read this last paragraph. And then just make a couple of comments. In view of that truthful and clearly drawn distinction between evangelical Christian, Christianity on the one side and Catholicism and Popedom on the other side, it is a high time that the Seventh-day Adventists should, with deep solicitude, be asking themselves whether they are really evangelical Christians or whether the system of professed organization with which you are identified and in unity is the evangelical order or whether it is the pseudo mosaic Catholic system tending towards the papal. Now, so there's a lot of information in there, um, but the basic idea that we see here, we, we can't argue with Jones here on this point, right? So what he's saying is, is definitely the truth that we are to be connected to Christ and, and not to man except through Christ. So no one has authority to shut another person out, out of the movement. I mean, obviously, if a person is is acting in a way that is unchristian, that is committing sins and belligerent and, and other types of things, you know, we as individuals can decide not to associate with that person. But n no man has the authority to tell another person what to think or believe. We can persuade, we can present the arguments from scripture, but we are not to act like popes, like the church. We're not to treat each other as the church treated us. So when it comes to the organization of this movement, my view is that in the last days, God takes the work into his own hands. Man machinery is not going to accomplish the work, but it doesn't mean that we don't try to work together. And, and accomplish things, right? But that means we have to be converted if we're going to be able to do that. Now, of course, most of you know we got a camp meeting planning for August, and I sent it in an email for the last week of August in Oregon, and uh, still lots of things to plan about that. But um, in no way in having a camp meeting are we seeking to start an organization. We just simply, it's another opportunity for people to hear this message. And to decide for themselves whether or not it's true. Just as we do the, the, these studies, it's just an opportunity to share what we have studied. Any thoughts on what we have read here uh, this evening? Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for each person. And thank you for the truths, even though they're difficult. You know, Lord, to follow you and to be servants uh, to others is not an easy path, but we ask, Lord, that you can help each one of us in revealing your character in how we conduct ourselves in this world and how we interact with one another. We pray for the truths of your word that they can, that your word can um, not come back void, that uh, the things that are shared on the internet and the people that we meet, that they will bear fruit. Bless each person. May your angels watch over us. Bless the meetings tomorrow. And help us as we struggle 
in this world of sin and suffering. Help us cling to you and to trust fully in you in all things. Thank you for hearing our prayer, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.